Welcome to Intuitive Connections, where spirituality and psychology meet to help you be your best and brightest self. I'm your host, Victoria Shaw, and in each episode, I'll help you to awaken your own inner wisdom, step into your power, and live a more divinely inspired life. You're here to let your inner light shine. Are you ready? Let's do this. Hello and welcome to Intuitive Connection. I'm your host, Intuitive Counselor Victoria Shaw, and today I am so super duper excited because we have a guest and it's a guest that I have wanted to interview for actually a really long time. So I'm really, really excited to have him here. Our guest is Stephen Farmer and Stephen is the author of some of my favorite spiritual development books and oracle decks, including Animal Spirit Guides, The Pocket Guide to Spirit Animals, Earth Magic, and uh, Your Animal Spirit Guide Oracle Decks, and so much more. And I'm so excited to share with him. He's also a trained psychotherapist, which is something else that we have in common, a shamanic practitioner. I think I already said that. And someone who, as we were talking before uh, we hit record, you know, shares, I think, this sort of interfacing as being someone who's sort of classically trained in psychology, but has uh, been willing to step out of the box and, you know, use the full range of the spiritual tools that I think are available to us in the healing and helping world. So Stephen, welcome. Well, thank you, Victoria. It's my pleasure to be uh, your guest. Yay. I'm excited. I wanted to start with the work that you do. And so you are a clinical psychologist, right? By training? Well, licensed psychotherapist is the way I would say it. Not technically, not a psychologist. My license uh, in the state of California is marriage, family, and child counselor. It allows me to say psychotherapist. Yeah, I'm the same thing. I have a doctorate in psychology, but my clinical degree is in counseling. So it's all good. And most of our listeners, we just basically spoke gobbledygook to them and they don't care. But I know exactly <laughs> what you, I know exactly what you mean. All right. So you are a psychotherapist, but you are also a shamanic practitioner. And you are also, you combine all those things. You're a hypnotherapist. You practice somatic experiencing, EMD. Are. Tell me a little bit about your journey. What came first? How did you bring all these things together? Because I know for some more classically trained people, myself excluded, um, these things don't seem like they go together at all. Uh, it's really true, but it, it would best be described, Victoria, as a synthesis of all these different modalities. Uh, I, as far as shamanic uh, healing or shamanic treatments, I always present that to the client as a possibility. Uh, because uh, for some clients, that's a little less, they don't really necessarily want to go down that pathway. But I do find that there are some commonalities. Example would be uh, the shamanic treatment of soul retrieval, which is, and this is like ancient, you know, right. the ancient methodologies, and they also cross cultures, I should say. For uh, the shamanic treatment, the premise is that due to some serious wounding or something that's happened to you or a few other reasons, you could lose a part of your soul, a fragment or something like that. So the, the practitioner's job is to, with the help of the guiding spirits, to be taken to the soul piece that was lost and bring it back. Now, to uh, psychologists, that may not be a real palatable kind of idea. But I got to tell you, based on my experience of over 25 years now of shamanic work, it works. You know, it really works. It helps someone feel a greater wholeness would be one way to describe it. Whereas because of a traumatic situation, the other approaches that I have available to me, all the training that I've done in the various modalities, like you mentioned, somatic experiencing, which another way to say it would be somatic therapy that trauma lives in the body. So it's a different perspective, you know, to work more directly with the body and the resulting thoughts and beliefs, et cetera. EMDR, which you mentioned, is I'm trained in that, certified in that. It's using eye movements or sound clicks, alternating eye movement sound clicks. Uh, and again, I could go into that, but I'll just leave it at that. Hypnosis or hypnotherapy, you know, is something I've been doing for Geez, well, I right out of my master's work, you know, I trained excellent guy. I just really uh, hit home, you know, with the methodology using hypnosis, altered states, et cetera. So I feel grateful and I feel blessed that I've been through these various trainings and I can sort of pull out of, you know, my pocket, you know, what do we need here, you know, for this particular client? And so that's, a, that's a kind of an overview, you know, of the things that I offer. So my first experience with shamanic work, believe it or not, 
was during my master's program in counseling. So my story really quick for you and also for listeners that maybe haven't heard all of the episodes yet was my intuition opened up for me really strongly um, in my mid thirties. And as soon as it did and information started coming through for people who soon became clients, I had this feeling, wow, I'm doing counseling because I would get all this information about those traumas, about, you know, what happened to you when you were 12. And I felt like, wow, um, being a trained psychologist, I was like, hey, I don't really want to do this without that grounding in something else. So I went back to school and I got my master's degree already, you know, having that broader perspective than I did say when I was doing my my first uh, graduate degree. But my first exposure to shamanic journeying was actually in a class, and it was in a class called Advanced Multiculturalism. And the professor's whole spiel, which I agree with a thousand percent, he's, he's like, look, psychologists, counselors, doctors, clergymen, we all come from this lineage of shamans. Shamans were the first healers, helpers, clergy. It was all one bundled up beautiful thing. And that, you know, we oh, what we do to that lineage, that we're all a part of that. And I think that's so powerful and important. And I think it's something that we so often in, you know, the left brain, we think we're a scientific world, forget, but, you know, shamanism came first and, you know, that is where we all come from. And I think it's interesting too. And I want to know what you think about this. I think more and more, the things that are becoming popular in the field are, are bringing us back to that. I mean, a lot of psychedelic assisted therapy now, which was something that has been part of shamanic practice forever. I, when I did my EMDR training, um, I started journeying. Like that's just where I went. Yeah. So I'm curious to know, because I think there is so much overlap. And I think sometimes, you know, we we like to call it one thing because we've been taught that that one thing is respectable, but I think we've been doing shamanism all along. Well, we've also um, forgotten. Yeah. And I am pleased to see that there is a remembrance that's going on. And when I say a remembrance, and that I think directly speaks to your comments about shamanism, is that slowly, I, or another way I describe it as the awakening process, you, you know, as a collective species, you know, that quite a few people, I think, in the last 25, 30 years, for whatever, whatever the means are, you know, are going through an awakening and understanding and appreciation, especially and I think this is what shamanism and shamanic practice brings, is that remembrance of our connection to all beings in this world. Right. And what I mean by that is uh, in some native languages or indigenous, I, sh I should say, uh, languages, uh, the stars are the star people, the tree people. You know, they're accorded that term in the native language to acknowledge the relationship that's there. And that's what we've largely forgotten. And at the same time, there's a very deep ancestral memory in each and every one of us. And it's almost like uh, something went ping, you know, to, in any any one of us, you know, who starts to explore these realms, you know, shamanism or otherwise. You know, there's other ways too, but certainly that's a foundation. I remember, Victoria, I, Again, it was over 20, I don't remember the date exactly, but over 25 years ago, I was hungering for something, you know, I, I had a very successful practice and I love my work. I've always loved my work. This is what I'm supposed to do. This is my purpose I'm, as a teacher and a healer. However, the uh, mission unfolds, you know, the mission may change and has changed over the years. But I remember I thought, okay, a friend of mine said to me, you ought to try this, you know, check out this book, The Way of the Shaman by Michael Harner, who I attribute as being a real central figure in bringing uh, shamanism into contemporary culture. Uh, thank you, Michael. He's ancestor now. You know, he's died some years ago, but he's left behind a legacy of so many people. And I had the good fortune of training with him. The initial two-day course after I read Way of the Shaman that my friend suggested, she also suggested, you should go, Here's there's some two-day introductory courses. And I thought, what the heck, you know, why not? Little did I know, <laughs> I came out of there on fire. In fact, I think Michael got a little irritated because I went up to him, I said, what do I do now? I need more of this, you know, this is exactly what I need, you know. And he's almost kind of like saying, he didn't say this, but all right, hold, slow down, boy. <laughs> <laughs> hold your horses, you know, that kind of thing. But anyway, I went on uh, to uh, take some different kinds of trainings, different approaches, different perspectives, 
uh, Celtic shamanism. Tom Cowan has been uh, instrumental in reviving a lot of the Celtic ways. Tibetan shamanism, Larry Peters, other foundation courses, etc. Huna, uh, Serge King. You know, I just was like gobbling them up because I went, this is, it's, I think everybody who's listening to this knows, and you know, you know, when something just is like speaking to you, you know, I'm obsessive compulsive enough that I pursue it like a mad dog, you know, or a hungry dog that pursues a, something to eat. So um, I'm grateful for all of the teachers that I've come across, the wisdom that I've been able to sort of bring into my own practice, etc., from other teachers. And, you know, at a certain point, uh, actually fairly quickly, I evolved from doing strictly a psychotherapy practice to uh, retiring that for a period of time. And then go on full force into writing about shamanic ideas that people can relate to. Like my first, I had some books uh, and still one is active as a therapist, self-help books. And then there was a gap of 10 years. And then I wrote the very first book in this genre. And the intention was to take something that really is an, an integral part of shamanism, yet people can relate to it. They don't have to be interested in that. It's called Sacred Ceremony. And it's still available. And uh, it was a really good book, you know, to put false humility aside. It's a really good book. Anyway, so I went on to write some other things, as you know, you know, animal spear guides, etc. And some oracle cards and uh, been very uh, like a, a good several years run <laughs> of uh, gratefully doing some of these publications that further encourage people to expand, you know, to wake up, you know, to these other realities. And I think we all have this remembering. I mean, I feel a deep connection. I've always felt a deep connection to the animal world, to the spirit world. When I was a child, I'd talk to trees and talk to rocks. And it was it was a very normal thing, as I think it is for many children, before we learn that there's something weird about doing that. But I also think so many of us, particularly the kind of people that are drawn to my podcast, that are drawn to your books, to your podcast, to the kind of work that we're doing, and even, even to the kind of work that we do as therapists, as healers, as helpers, it's awakening a deep memory in them because they too have walked this lineage and done this kind of work in other bodies and other places. And they too are feeling that call to awaken that up. And I know that like animal science is huge, not just for me, but for so many people. And I think, again, it's remembering of that time when, you know, we did feel that deep connection with the circle of life. We did feel that deep connection with nature. You know, when an animal comes into my world and they do all the time now, today I got to visit with my dolphin friends when I was walking on the beach, which is always such a pleasure and a treat. But when we draw those into our awareness and into their space, I think it's always sacred, right? It's always a sacred experience. And mm -hmm. I think we all have that innate knowing that it is. And I think more and more people feel drawn to it. So I think, you know, your books and the kind of work that you're doing and putting out there, it's it's huge because it's helping people remember that they've had this connection all along. Uh, so true. And thank you for that. Yes, I. Uh, that's really the intent of the books and the Oracle cards too, for the large bulk of them, is to rediscover or discover that, de again, that deep ancestral memory of when we could not just uh, go, oh, what a nice deer. Oh, look at the deers in the forest, you know, but that plus, okay, what does deer spirit have to say to me? You know, what's right. the mess? And that's a big part of what I teach is how to uh, pay attention, first off, you know, to unusual sightings, you know, the uh, butterfly that flits right across and maybe lands on your nose, even which happened to me one time. Uh, I teach my teaching basically is 25 words or less, you know, if that's the number of words is that when an animal appears in an unusual way or repeatedly in a short space of time, that's when a great spirit or God is sending that messenger, that courier to you. And then uh, it could be in a symbolic form too. In other words, it could be a dream or it could be a writing on a poster or something. But uh, when that happens, it's a pretty big deal. And I want to encourage people to see it as a big deal and also know that they too, they can discern the message. You know, this is what I teach in the workshops, you know, here's how you do it. You know, and I give a, not a formula so much, but just as guidelines, you know, steps to how to receive and also discern what the message is. I've had the joy of seeing people really take to it and just be so enthusiastic and, and ready to go and then talk about some of their earlier experiences and they can now have a different context for it. So it's a lot of, like uh, you said earlier, it's a lot of fun too. 
you know, and uh, we are at a critical juncture, you know, in our relationship with the world right now, with the earth. There's a fascinating, this is a bit of an aside, but the fascinating series I've been watching on Netflix called Life on Our Planet. Highly recommend it. I'm putting a plug in there, you know. All right, get... we'll put it in the show notes for sure. Okay, good. So anyway, that it's a real joy, Victoria. And you know what I'm saying about this is it's a real joy to discover the magic and the miraculousness of this amazing planet that we have such a privilege to actually experience life and what it's like to be. And I mean, all of life, you know, the suffering, the joys, the discoveries, the et cetera, just uh, every so often I just get a wave of appreciation for that you know thank you thank you great spirit and um i think that's important too is like you did the invocation you know is to find rituals find sacred rituals that help uh, facilitate that memory coming forth and be enacted into the world not just remembered but enacting that into the world you know that great spirit wow is in everything in this breath there's a prayer I do that says, you know, whatever I touch, I know that it's you, that the wind is your breath, et cetera, et cetera. Aww. It's just, yeah, it's really a beautiful prayer came across. All right, I want to talk about that. Oh my God, my brain is spinning. But I also want to go back to the animal signs before we leave that one behind. Because first of all, what I love about my animal sightings and my animal signs is it's it's a potent reminder to what you just said, that we're all connected, that everything's connected. That, you know, every part of this world is supporting me, listening to me, responding to me, you know, giving me messages. And, you know, when I have those interactions with my plant and animal friends, it's just, it's such a reminder of that. But I also want to talk for people. I've done some episodes on this. You know, how do I know if it's a sign and how do I interpret them? And I'm going to tell you that when I started on this journey, the way that I would interpret all animal signs it was I would go to your book. <laughs> so I tell people now all the time, feel into what it means to you. But the truth of the matter was when I first started uh, really feeling into these animal encounters, what I would always do is go to Stephen Farmer's book and look for the animal in the book. And whatever it said in the book, that was the meaning for me. And I really believe so heartily that my guides and the universe knew that this was what I was going to do. That one day um, when a pig was walking up my driveway, I lived in suburban Connecticut at the time. So again, this was somewhat unexpected, but a pig was walking up my driveway one day and I ran inside to find your beautiful book. And all of the books have been taken down off my shelves because we were painting the bookcase. And I remember this moment of what am I going to do? How will I interpret this sign if I can't find Stephen's book? And then I turned around and of course I was guided to it. And I don't remember what a pig means or meant in that context, but of course it was spot on. And, you know, I think you're a vessel for messages and guidance, right? The universe knew I was going to use your beautiful books in just that way, but it's not the only way, right? I know that we want to sell your books and I love your books, but there are other ways to do it too, right? Well, that, uh, yeah, Victoria, I'm glad that it was helpful. I got a puppy dog back here. Your um, puppy dog is just fine and adorable. So eager to go out for a walk. <laughs> it's okay, buddy. Come here. Anyway, um, lately I teach, I like to simplify things too. That's one thing. Not oversimplify, but make it easy. You know, people can understand. And just to, as a general teaching method, I like things in threes and fours. Okay. You tell me three ways to be successful at this or that, or an article I wrote, you know, recently, three ways that an animal can calm your anxiety. So I teach, uh, there's three ways to discern what the message is. One is what you just described, which is, yeah, go look in the book, you know, or the internet, you know, it's not just my book, but you could do, uh, what's the meaning of a rabbit running across my path? Especially, I would say, the only qualification I would say about that is that, especially when it's kind of new to you, right. you know, you can look it up and you can see that there's a, a relevance, you know, to the message. Like in the book you mentioned, Animal Spirit Guides, there's usually anywhere from six to eight possible messages. And I always yeah. tell people, see which one grabs you, right. you know, which one resonates with you. Uh, so that's the first one. Look it up. Internet, book, whatever. You know, Ted Andrews was really an inspiration. His book, Animal Speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he had some good information there and I gave him credit, you know, for the information I got. The second thing I tell people is think about the characteristics of the physical animal. Example, rabbit, 
what do they do when they spot they're they're on alert? So that's one physical characteristic. They can turn in just a heart, you know, like a the snap of the fingers. So quick turns, et cetera, et cetera. A bear, what is it about a bear? Well, a bear, you don't mess with a bear. <laughs> Strong boundaries would be a, a way to interpret that as far as how the physical characteristics of the animal will uh, provide a message. You know, you just got to extrapolate the metaphor. You know, what does it really mean? The third way, and this is where I would like everybody to get to eventually, direct revelation. It's a principle of shamanism that you get the information from your guides, your spirit right. guides, animal spirits, archangels, ancestors, you know, whoever you team with in uh, the ordinarily non-visible beings, including spirit animals, of course, those are the resources for you. And direct revelation means you go to the spirit animal. And again, a bear showing up, for instance, let's say on the side of a truck, you see an image of a bear and it's the third one you've seen or experienced in some symbolic way. You would then close your eyes, take a couple of deep breaths, unless you're driving, of course. Close your eyes, take a couple of deep breaths and say, bear, spirit. It's not the physical bear. It's the spirit, the collective consciousness of all bears, you could right. say is one way to look at it. Bear spirit, what's your message for me? And then you pay attention to what you see, what you hear, what you feel inside you as well as outside because you've posed the question to that, that spirit animal. Beautiful. Now you're going to get your answer right away, but you got to pay attention what you see, hear, and feel and then uh, see if it resonates. Right. And, oh, and a big word, T, the T word. No, not the T word. I'm looking at the dog, not treats. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but trust it. Trust what you get. Right. It may that's right away or it might be kind of mysterious and cryptic. But either way, that's your message. So the practice of direct revelation, I think, is important, you know, with this sort of thing. Eventually, like I say, I encourage you, look it up, you know, if you're still wanting sort of a quick answer, you know, or a quick response, that's a great way to do it. Or you're just starting out. And then again, if you're more analytical, analyze the characteristics of the physical animal and there you can draw from that, you know, what the possible message is. But I always think too, I love what you said, because this is what I practice and what I teach. Look at what resonates. That's how I use Oracle decks. That's how I use everything. And that's what I tell my clients when they call me to hear their spiritual messages out of my windpipes, right? Because that's what I do as, you know, a professional psychic, intuitive, whatever you want to call it. I receive guidance for people. And I receive guidance for people because sometimes when we are too much in our own lives, it feels good to get it from someone else's lips. Not because my clients can't get it themselves and aren't getting it themselves all the time. Of course they are. We always are, right? But sometimes it's just helpful to hear it from another set of windpipes. And yeah. what yeah. I always tell my clients, you know, for the first time anyone comes to work with me, I always say, you know, take what resonates, let the rest go. And I think that is just how we should you know, interface with every aspect of this world. When you go to the doctor, when you read a book, when you get a message, you feel in and you see how it resonates with you. And that's your intuition at work, right? So I, I love right. that. I love that. And that's obviously, you know, because I have read your books. Have I mentioned that a few times? And, you know, it's true. And, and it's not just your books. If you Google, if you look, you know, anyone who says the definitive meaning of a bear is this, is disempowering you, right? Because there isn't just one meaning. It depends on how it resonates with you, what your conditioning is, what you've learned about bears, what's going on right now when the bear comes into your awareness, right? It's always what resonates for you uniquely in the now is is the truth of pretty much anything. So yeah, I, I mean, bear might might say a message totally unrelated to the characteristics of the animal, right? And say, okay, it's time to call your mother, right? <laughs> Maybe. That's a message from bear spirit. Yeah. You know, what I mean, though, is that it could be not specifically related to the spirit. It's very possible. I find that a little unusual, but it does happen that way, is that people get reminders or they get messages that seem rather oblique as mm -hmm. far as from a spirit animal or a source like that. But uh, it does it, it resonates. Great right. term. I love that term because it implies, to me, it implies that you get a sensation in your body as right. well like a check, like, oh, yeah, that feels right. 
or like you said, intuition. And I've come to believe more and more that intuition is largely physically based first, and then it gets translated into thoughts, the inner voice, et cetera, uh, visuals, et cetera. But I could be wrong, but it's lately made that that kind of sense to me as, and I'm a body or, you know, I'm body oriented there anyway. So it makes sense to me in that way. My process is always dropping into my body. So again, I don't know either, but I always have the sensation of dropping into my body and then the messages flow. So. Yeah, it resonates. You know, that's yeah. why resonance has that vibrational characteristic meaning to it. So yeah, it's and it's uh, fun too, because I believe strongly based on experience that, you know, God or spirit, whichever you have prefer, you know, it doesn't matter. It's whatever name works for you. I like spirit or great spirit, but that we are able to receive the guidance, you know, from the natural world. However, that comes through, even in this world that is also in areas where it's dominated by the industrial, um, technological, et cetera, that we can kind of slip our consciousness underneath that, so to speak, and be able to address concerns and questions by asking and listening. You mentioned dolphins. Interesting because you say, you know, the dolphins, Victoria. Once a month, Jessica, my assistant and wife, uh, will draw a card and it will go on to the newsletter, which just went out. And this one was from the Spirits of Nature, messages from the Spirits of Nature oracle cards. Guess which one showed up? Of course, it was a dolphin, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And the key word, often there's a, well, often, always, there's a key word or two. And the key word, the key, and also there's been some other experiences, people talking about dolphins. So dolphins, energy or his spirit is everywhere. But the key word from the cards is listening. And it's based on their uh, way of going through the ocean by echolocation. You know, they send out a sound and it comes back to them and it tells them, gives them a map of what's going on in the ocean. So um, I would encourage everybody to pay attention to that, is to really listen. Listen, not just with your ears. Right. Listen with your heart. Listen with your mind. Listen with your body, like we've just been talking about. So uh, there's no coincidence that you brought up dolphins. I love that. And I love that because one of the things that the image that I get as soon as you say that is and it's something I've been I've been in the process of deepening once again, my connection to my guides. I mean, I talk to guides for a living. It's what I do, but you can always get better at it. And the way that I see and the way that I teach a lot of times too, is especially when I'm asking a question for myself, what you really do, it's really like echolocation, right? You send out the ping and then you wait for it to come back. So I love that image because today when I was walking on the beach, what I was thinking, I was like, I want to even go deeper now. Like, I know that there's even more you have to say to me and more and even a deeper, stronger connection. So thank you for validating that for me, my friend. Oh, uh, you got it. You know, and that's how that works. Yeah. You, know, you just said, you know. Always. Um, yeah, it always. It's always working. There's, there's input, you know, information coming to you in this way. Yeah. We got to learn how to listen. <laughs> Here we go again. You know, we have to, uh, to listen with all of us. What I often say, once you ask the question of the spirit animal and what you see, hear, and feel, some people call them the four clairs, clairaudience. Right. I just like it straightforward, you know, see, hear, yeah. feel. Boom, simple. Like I said, I like that information. What do you see, hear, feel? Inside and out. Bingo. Yeah. End of story. I love it. And it takes it out of your brain and having to have a definitive answer and having to know and having to figure it out, which is sort of the antithesis of our intuition. So I love that. It takes yeah, it into yeah. the present moment. Yeah. I also, um, to kind of shift a little bit, but still very relevant, I really encourage everyone to have a spirit daily spiritual discipline. And that can mean different things to different people. Uh, it could be, you mentioned some that you do, the invocation that you offered here prior to the recording in our conversation. My particular sacred ritual is in the morning, uh, along with a cup of coffee, you know, I, I love my coffee, is I'll sit down and I, I used to do this longhand years ago, but I don't do it anymore. I, I do the computer, but I have a journal. I have journals that go back like 10 years, you know, when I started doing it in this way on the computer. Uh, what I do is I'll put the date, et cetera, and then I just do a little journaling. You know, this is what's going on with me, blah, 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 blah. 
uh, something that I want to preserve. I probably maybe will never read it again. I don't know, but there's something about just getting it out, you know, and onto the mechanism, the computer. And then I do a very simple thing, which is I'm so familiar with um, altered states of consciousness that it's fairly easy for me to drift into a, like a mild altered state as I'm, I know that's true for you as well. Um, and then I put my hands on the keyboard and typically uh, I'll write something like ancestors or I'll put a T for teacher, you know, that could be ancestors or anybody who shows up that they may not know exactly or Raven, you know, or one of my main uh, spirit animals called power animals. And then my fingers start writing. I love that's, it. That's why I describe it. You know, I, I become a reporter, a transcriber. And uh, frankly, Victoria, I know the messages, I would say 85%, roughly 90% of the time, really have impact or really have meaning. And they go beyond, you know, the usual thinking. And that's what we got to do is get outside of the, the usual thinking. That's okay. It's valuable. Usual thinking says, okay, what do I got to get at the grocery store? You know, so I make a list, et cetera. But we're talking about something a little different than that, you know, which is to bypass the usual mode of processing things, you know, through our brain. And it really works for me. And it has worked for me for many years, you know, do a little reporting, just chatty, blah, 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 and then take a breath take a couple of breaths, you know, get centered, feet on the ground, et cetera, connect with Mother Earth, no matter what else is between you and her, and then uh, allow the information to come forward. Allow the information to come forward. That's and a very is, important word. You got to be receptive, you know, to be receptive, what's going to put you there? Your breath. Always. I want to give you one more, if I may say one more thing. Please. About I came across something, and Andrew Weil actually promoted it, and it does come from, as I understand, pranayama yoga, as I understand it. I Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that's what Andrew Weil has stated. And what you do is you breathe in for four counts, and then you hold it for seven, and then you exhale for eight. And what I found in doing this for the last couple of years is that first off, the breath in, you know, it's kind of what we do when we're startled. We take a deep breath in, but this time, instead of just going, we hold it and it allows our body to absorb the oxygen. Right. And then not the eight, uh, just try this out, gang, whoever's listening, try it out, do it about three or four times just to see how it feels. My experience on number eight though is, I can feel any tension I've been holding in my body and my shoulders, particularly is where I tend to just melts. Yeah. Cause you slow down or like tortoise said to me, slow down. <laughs> You've got all the time in the world. That's in the power animals oracle. <laughs> That's <laughs> what sounded when I transcribed what he told me anyway. So just try that breathing pattern and um, see what happens, you know, see how it feels to you. Puts you in a receptive, puts me in a receptive mode. I love it. I mean, I love four, seven, eight breathing and it's, it's really powerful. So I definitely encourage people to try that. It's good too. Sometimes I find before bed that helps me, helps me settle down, calm the mind, but it's really, it's really a good one. And I also love the idea of journaling in the morning. And I love that you do the little brain dump first, get that off your chest and really tune in. I think it's beautiful. And as you were talking about talking to tortoise, I got a little view of your process, which is so lovely because I'm always curious when I read these books, you know, well, how do you know what the tortoise said? So I can really see as you share your ability to tune in and receive those messages, which is just beautiful. Well, I also teach, you know, is uh, what you hear, what you see, what you feel. But typically one is stronger than the others. Right. Example would be hearing auditory, you know, is my what do they call it my default right you know i'm i'm always listening not just to my thoughts but to something a little deeper than that you know when i'm when i'm especially when i'm doing the work you know or asking a spirit animal second very close in line with that is the body the sensories you know i often say you know my hair stands up but i call it my fur <laughs> yeah i'm having a spiritual experience my fur is standing up you know and i can see it and i can feel it etc you know and i'm not cold so it's something else that's going right. on it's like antenna that go up <laughs> yeah 
I actually don't get the chills, which is kind of a bummer anymore because I can feel when my clients get the chills, but I don't get it. But the chills don't lie. Like you can't give your, you can't make the hair stand up on your arms, right? <laughs> like things like that are so visceral that, you know, you're not going to ask that question that everyone asks me when I'm teaching intuition development. How do I know if I'm imagining it or not? Like when you got the chills, you have the chills. You That's can't talk yourself into that. In fact, even the word imagination, I, I'm on a mission to reframe the meaning that it really is a bridge between ordinary reality and non-ordinary reality. Um, it'll take you there, you yes. know, and what you do with it once you're there is about conversations like we're having here. Yeah, a million percent. Yeah. So uh, it's, again, shifting to imagination is not fantasy or daydreaming, you know, that is imagination too. It's a corollary of imagination. But in this context, it's how else are you going to perceive these things that are ordinarily unseen or unheard or unfelt? And it's imagination, you know, come on, gang, have Imagination. Yeah, that is the gateway to intuition for sure. And every kid in their imaginary play is connecting in that way. And then at some point, someone says to us, that's not real. And we shut it down. Oh, that's, uh, I've heard that story so many times, you know, that people that are now like have really opened up or are opening up and then uh, they realize that they had shut it down, you know, seven years old. Somebody said, oh, you're yeah. just making it up. Oh, I got to tell you a funny story, short story. Okay, real short story. So I'm doing my morning ritual. Oh, actually, excuse me. No, I was walking my dogs. I got two dogs, the little gray guy that you heard earlier. I was walking my dogs and it was uh, twilight. You know, it's almost the uh, sun had just set. And often I'm getting downloads, you know, as I'm walking and I pay attention to that. And that's really good information. But at one point, <laughs> you're going to appreciate this. I think everybody will that's listening, Victoria, is I actually stopped in my tracks and I got this puzzled expression on my face, if anybody could have seen it. And then I heard my thoughts, not the voice, but I heard my thoughts. And I thought, God, maybe I'm just making all this up. And then I heard this chorus of laughter from my spiritual team. <laughs> I, it was so like, come on, dude. You've been at this enough. You can't, you know, you know the difference, you know. It was yeah. really. I still laugh at that and I get a little bit of prickles on the back of my head because it was a reminder. I thought I had to think about it too later. I thought, well, maybe they were laughing at me because I am making this up, you know? And then again, I heard the echo of their laughter and they're like, come on. They don't laugh at us. They always laugh with us and for us and yeah. lovingly. <laughs> as, uh, as I would say, I got the joke. You know? Yeah. I got the joke. So I was able to join in the laughter with them but i thought it was so it's such a riot after so many years of this yeah. practice you know to hear hear myself even think that i'm making this up i can tell when i when it's ego you know yeah. the, the ego i've learned enough to discern that what's up pop? my puppy's whining a little bit. all right all right well your puppy is telling us because i could keep having this conversation forever there's so many more questions i want to ask but i want to talk really 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 quickly um before we wrap up about this thing about power animals because I know that there are certain animals that I feel a strong resonance with. And I know that there are certain animal visitors that come to me at different times in my life. So big ones for me are all raptors, hawks, eagles, but especially hawks. Rattlesnakes have been huge for me since I've moved to California. They show up for me all the time in the most you know delightful ways in dolphins. But how do you know what your power animals are? Like, I, I think I know how I know, but... <laughs> <laughs> what would you tell sure. someone who didn't know how they knew? I'll keep this relatively brief, but you can go to a shamanic practitioner. Okay. That would be one of the treatments they could provide is to find your power animal and bring it back to you and then sort of install it. Okay. Ooh. That's, that's one possibility. The other is just an animal that keeps showing up for you again and again and again and again, not just two or three times, but repeatedly, repeatedly, repeatedly. Here's what I advise. Again, telepathically, you know, are you my power animal? And then pay attention. You'll get a yes or a no. So that's that's another way. They will tell you, you know, whether they are or not. But look for the repetition, not just, again, two or three times, too, that it just persistently shows up again and again. Uh, the first power animal, and by the way, I should say about power animal, it's a shaman. It comes from shamanism, but it's not exclusive to shamanism. Okay. It's a special, it's a long-term relationship. We're talking years. Whereas animal spirit guides or spirit animals, what we've been talking about are just like 
typically occasional visitations. Okay. Maybe repeated in a short, you know, two or three times in a short time. Another one, uh, as far as power animals go, is, I'll tell you a short story. I was in a men's event and we did a meditation standing. And this is before I trained at all in shamanism or went to that two-day course and shot out of there. And snake came to me in the meditation. And I went, well, that's kind of cool, you know, be Stephen Snake Farmer, you know, <laughs> something like that. And um, I learned since then that that snake came to me for a reason. And that has become one of my power animals and has developed. Again, I could tell you the next 15 minutes, I could tell you the progression of that, even to the point of having a tattoo on my uh, shoulder. My only tattoo is of two snakes intertwined. The Cosmic Serpent, Jeremy Narby, go read it. Anyway, so that that's another way is just a very significant impact of a particular spirit animal that comes to you. You might keep dreaming about this one. Always ask though, ask. Okay. Are you my power animal? In some traditions, the belief is that a child is born with a spirit animal that will be with them the rest of their lives. Power animals, uh, we just don't have that kind of uh, training or consciousness at this point. And it doesn't matter because you, as if you're 60 or 90 years old, you could still find your power animal. So ask, ask the universe, as they say, you know, I'd like to know what my power animal is and then pay attention to what happens from there. And if you're not sure, just ask. And that, that spirit animal will stay with you for years. They eventually may fade out and someone else comes in. It's possible. I've got actually five now, now that I think about it, starting with the snake spirit. And is it the energy of the animal that makes it a power animal versus just a guide? I mean, are they awakening something in you? Or are they supporting you in some way that's different than an animal visitor? I think it's the, it's the relationship. Wow. That you have an ongoing relationship with this animal. So you become very familiar, not just with the animal, but with the spirit animal. I always thank Snake for showing up for any kind of healing, because that's one of the medicines of Snake. I, I thank Raven for the guidance, because Raven has the capacity to bring uh, information from the dark into the light. Well, I can see Raven, where's Raven? Oh, there he is. Okay. And he flies out, you know, from the twilight, the hours of twilight for instance. Beautifulness. And what about my beautiful raptor, my beautiful hawk friend? Ask. I'll ask. When I was traveling in 2019 to Egypt, I've told the story before, but I was terrified. This was a trip that just, it was out of my comfort zone in every way. It was a completely life-changing experience, but boy, before I changed my life, I was terrified and, and I almost chickened out a bunch of times. And every time I would have a wave of apprehension, every single time, I would look up in the sky and see a hawk or a soaring bird every time. And this was this went on for from the time I signed up, which was a year before I took the trip. And since then, my beautiful, I associate the hawk with Horus, even though Horus is a falcon, but <laughs> that's that was my association. But it's been with me ever since. And whenever I feel like I need that power boost, that confidence boost, that you know, remembering that um, I have that that hawk's perspective, that bird's eye perspective, I will see a soaring bird. That's your power animal. Yeah, definitely. Or a power animal. Definitely. I just tuned in and yes. So again, I want you to feel confident about that too. I think that's what's important. So you check as well, but that's what I get. Yeah. I yeah. feel myself going into a very slight altered state and I saw hawk and I saw what you just described about perspective you know, being able to see the big picture. Yeah. And I must say, also being able to focus when needed. Ah, I need and more of that one. <laughs> you Maybe do, I have it. You do have it. And if you're not sure, ask Hawk or thank Hawk. Oh, thank I'm providing me the focus that I need. I'm going to have a little dialogue with Hawk. I think after we finish this one up oh, for sure, Stephen, this has been so much fun. And I think there's so many practical hands-on tools that people are going to take away from this episode. And mm -hmm. also talking about shamanism and animal science is just always my happy place. And I know a lot of my listeners feel the same way. Um, what else didn't we cover yet that you want to make sure everyone knows about, including your beautiful offerings? Well, I think that the other 
aspect of my work has to do with ancestors. And I pray a lot these days to the ancestors and recognizing increasingly, in fact, one of my latest uh, Oracle card decks is messages from the ancestors. And I really had to let it work me because how do you do it? Grandma, grandpa, you know, what? Right. how far do you go with this? And then realizing that, no, there are, first off, that we are related ancestrally to all beings. You know, how did we get here? You know, it's one of those, if you think back. And that that was validated by Mindahe Batista, who I, and forgive me, I, I keep thinking he's from Guatemala, but he's indigenous. And I interviewed him for my podcast and he talked about the ancestors going way, way back. And I went, validation, okay, for what was given to me to uh, create these cards. So I'm doing a lot with the ancestors. Let's put it that way. And recognizing more and more that that whole idea, the concept and the relationships are so broad and there are so many and it goes back to the depths of our being, you know, definitely. I love that. And, you know, I never thought about that term that way because I know a lot of traditions, spiritual traditions, talk about connecting to the ancestors. And I never really thought about it until the way that you say it today, the hit that I get and the way that I see it is it really connects us to the inner interconnectedness of everything, right? Right back to source. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. I'd never seen it in that context before. I'm glad you caught that. And yes, it does. It reminds us of just how intimately related we are. There's a fascinating show on Netflix. You know, I've been telling everybody (laughs) it's called Life on Our Planet. Right. Uh, Steven Spielberg produced it. Morgan Freeman narrates it, and the crew from Jurassic Park series are the ones that created the CGI of the prehistoric animals, but more than the animals, back to fungi. I mean, just the the epics. Anyway, check it out, guys. We totally will. I love it. People want to find you. They want to work with you. They want to find your stuff. How do they do that? Uh, Send money. Okay. (laughs) It's all good. You can send him money. He's awesome. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. So anyway, it's DR, like website, easy, DR, Dr. Stephen, and that's with a V, farmer.com. Facebook, same thing, Dr. Stephen Farmer. Go to Facebook. Dolphin, the Dolphin card's on Facebook right now, too. So go check that out. You know I will. Card. Uh, that's the best way to get in touch with me. And I've got a, a superb mentorship program that uh, I'm really enjoying, you know, and meeting some just amazing people that are looking to me for mentorship, which is great. It's awesome. Well, you've been at it a long time and so much wisdom there. Thank you so much for sharing with everyone today. This was so much fun. And always to thank you, all of you wonderful, beautiful listeners, because if you were not tuning in, I wouldn't get to talk to fun people like Stephen Farmer. So I am so grateful for all of you. I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I did. And namaste. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that you found joy, strength, inspiration, and clarity from today's episode. If you'd like to learn more and connect with an amazing group of like-minded souls, please join us over on Facebook in the Intuitive Connection Community Facebook group, where we explore these topics in deeper detail, have additional live teachings, and host Facebook Lives with our amazing guests. I hope to see you there. And of course, if you want to learn more about me or the work that I do, please check out my webpage, victoriashawintuitive.com. Thank you so much again and namaste.